Uh, but this is, this is a, not that the other ones are important, but this one is a very uh, one that uh, the adversary uses, uh, one of his devices for us to be ignorant toward. And what I want to do is not only review what we've covered in regards to it, but to um, go through all of chapter 14. We're obviously, and to get done what I want to get done, we're not going to be able to expound a great t detail in connection with it, but I think just the, the <clears throat> skipping that will go through um, chapter 14, you'll get the idea of what Paul is having to deal with and the nature of his correction to the Corinthians. And the, again, I'll point out some things in relationship to that. Um, and then I want to spend the rest of the time we have going through, uh, give you kind of a modern history of the new Pentecost, uh, <clears throat> which started, uh, it's always been around to some degree, but it really came, came on the scene again in about 1901. And uh, we'll talk about uh, Charles Parham and William Seymour and Agnes Osman and um, those characters who are involved in, in uh, the new awakening and all those kind of things and where it has led to today with the Toronto blessing and um, all these kind of things. And um, so again, we'll, we'll, we'll touch on some of those things and some, uh, I'll mention some resources that kind of give you some information in relationship to that. Again, I don't endorse everything in regards to these resources, but um, on this issue, uh, they provide you some understanding. With that being said, let's read chapter 14. Um, I'm, just for time's sake, I'm just going to read. <clears throat> I'm going to read verses one through five, and we'll pray, and then we'll get into it here this evening. First Corinthians chapter 14, verses one through five. Paul says, "Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God." For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification, and exhortation, and comfort. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. I would that ye all spake with tongues, but rather that ye prophesied. For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time to open up your word and look at this matter regarding spiritual gifts once more and begin to narrow our focus on what Paul does here in chapter 14 regarding tongues. It is the last on the, the ranking of spiritual gifts, and, um, but it's also the one that is most prevalent today in Pentecostalism and in the charismatic movement. It is the easiest one to fake. It's the easiest one to counterfeit. And, um, and therefore, not only was it being uh, a means of influencing negatively the church at Corinth, the churches at Corinth, but it's also used negatively in regards to what's going on today in Christendom. And um, if they are Christians, and hopefully if they believe the gospel, obviously we know that they are. Um, but a lot of these things uh, so, so swerve from the truth. They name your name. They name your son's name. But, and they may speak to you with their lips, but their heart is far from you. And, um, and so, Father, I pray that we wouldn't be ignorant of Satan's devices, ignorant of his uh, use of these kind of things, because they are not the same exact thing of what was going on when the spiritual gift was legitimate, and uh, again, just gain some understanding as we go through chapter 14 and, and understanding what's going on today as well. So again, we give you all the thanks and praise in Christ's name. Amen. Again, we've taken a look at uh, quite a few different things. We've taken a look at the, the, the bigger picture of spiritual gifts, that there's a diversity of gifts, and those diversities of gifts are designed to fulfill differences of administrations. They are to administer different things. And the, all that's designed to fulfill different operations that God has. <clears throat> and we, we just quickly took a glance at those things and, and quickly went over those things. Uh, there's a lot more that we could deal with in connection with that. We've also looked at the 
ranking of the spiritual gifts at the end of chapter 12 there. Apostles, prophets, teachers, miracles, gifts of healings, helps, governments, and diversities of tongues. And, um, <clears throat> and then we also saw that uh, he says, covet earnestly the, the best gifts, but yet I show unto you a more excellent way. And that's what the, the totality of chapter 13 really dealt with. And the more excellent way is godly love and charity. And the way in which godly love and charity was going to be taught um, eventually and in, in, uh, fully is through knowledge. Not knowledge in part, but the complete knowledge. And that was going to be... And the reason why, by the way, it has to be the complete knowledge is because what you begin to see... When we talk about godly love and charity, we're not only talking about it in connection with how we're supposed to learn how God loves and therefore love others that way. That's definitely a part of it. But all that is modified, uh, uh, motivated by, the, by God's love and what he did and what it, what it accomplishes. And so part of the complete knowledge of God is not only that he died on the cross, was buried, and rose again. We know that in, while yet we were sinners, God committed his love toward us. But what did that produce? And you don't understand the totality of that until the complete knowledge comes, until the, uh, all the knowledge, the fullness of the knowledge comes. And that's what we get in Paul's latter epistles, is what the, the, the event of the cross, but also the spiritual provision that the cross is through his death, burial, and resurrection, what it's ultimately going to accomplish. What it ultimately accomplishes is that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he's going to gather all things in Christ, things that are in heaven and things that are on earth, even in him. And, um, and so you, you, you learn the, the dimensions of that and the dynamic nature of all that. And that's what's coming, and that's what they have to look forward to. And in connection with all that, that's supposed to produce, through the instruction of godly love and charity, love and, and charity. And so the more excellent way is not only... Uh, charity, but the nature in which the, the, the love and the charity is going to come about, it's going to be taught. It's going to be taught in connection with the cross. It's going to be taught in connection with God's counsel and what ultimately it's going to produce and our role and our participation in that. And that's what's coming. That's not what is, uh, you have when you're in the Corinthian epistle. Now, again, there's a necessity to gain the fundamentals and the foundation. In fact, if you don't have that, then anything you then then even when you're in Ephesians, if you don't have the right foundation, then it's almost in one sense useless. We talked about that many times as we talked about godly edification. Um, you can learn about the the right materials, right? You can learn. It's like if you built something and you got the right materials. When you're in Paul's epistles, you got the right material, but the way in which it's put together is that this thing would be constructed as an edifice, as a as a building. And um, all too often, Christians just, uh, and not even Christians, but grace believers, come to identify the right materials, but they have no idea how it's supposed to be put together. And uh, it's that process, by the way, that is often neglected, and because they don't want to put in the time and the work, um, just like anything else in regards to uh, of building. Uh, it, if you, you take a look at someone who purchases land and wants to build a new house, that takes quite a bit of time, and, and you, and you got to wait, and, and it depends on the workers, it depends on <clears throat> um, how many they have, and those kind of things, and, and the licenses, and all these kind of things, all the, the loops you have to go through, and, and then the, the foundation, laying the foundation, and finally you start to build the superstructure on that, and all those kind of things, but it takes time, and um, how even more uh, would it be in connection with God's word? And so again, the, the, the fundamentals, the, the not complete knowledge um, is still necessary to go through and take the time to make sure it's laid. In fact, the Corinthians and the Galatians had that problem, is they had the fundamental doctrines of Romans. But he says, he says I speak unto them that are perfect. The, the Corinthians didn't have the Romans doctrine, the fundamentals, properly laid and so Paul couldn't even teach them the things that they were supposed to learn. Through the, and, and, and he was able to give that to them through the spiritual gifts. It wasn't written down yet, but he was able to give them more uh, uh, perfect wisdom and perfect knowledge. And he restrained from giving it to them. Because the things that they were supposed to understand, it wasn't operating. 
uh, in, the, in the Corinthian church. In fact, the opposite was operating. And that's why you have three epistles after Romans before you get to Ephesians. And uh, in Ephesians, you're going to have not only that it's, he has the access to that knowledge, he's writing that down. He's writing it down right when he's supposed to and right in the situation that he's in and all these kind of things. But, um, and he's writing it to the saints that have Romans doctrine working in them properly so now he can give them that more perfect knowledge. So anyway, there's a lot of things in connection with that. We can't spend too much time on that. But uh, that's what Romans 13 is about, that more excellent way in the, in the knowledge that's going to come and all those kind of things. However, and, and this is often what's neglected in this uh, the, the debate of whether spiritual gifts are still in operation today is they come along and say, well, look at chapter 14. He's telling them how to use tongues in the church. So tongues still exist. Well, he just got done saying that they're going to cease, fail, and vanish away. But that doesn't mean, okay, now we flip the page and we're into chapter 14, you know, or he comes along as he's writing, here, I'm getting to chapter 14, well, now they're gone, so I'm never going to talk about them again. That's just foolish, that's just, folks, that's just stupidity. There's no way to get around that. That's just foolishness, is that they're still in operation. So the issue is, is I got to teach you how to conduct yourself with them, and what they're for, and their usefulness, and how you're abusing them, and all those kind of things. And in that, we can learn so much of what they were used for, and also what is the, the main thing in regards to a local assembly. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to cover chapter 14, his instruction, correction, reproof, rebuking of their use and misuse of these things, and giving them instruction of how they're supposed to operate. <laughs> And, uh, uh, folks, the, the way in which you see the counterfeit operating today in churches, that's what's taking place in Corinth. And you, you, you have a mixture of those that have the, the real spiritual gift of tongues, because, again, that's going to be the one that's focused uh, upon. That, uh, uh, you have that, but the ones that have the legitimate gift of tongues aren't using it in the church unless... There's an interpreter. They're not using the church. So guess who are the only ones that are using the church? The counterfeiters. The counterfeiters can be ones who are, are just doing a, a, the counterfeit, the, the, a, a, a babbling. Or you have those, by, by implication of what Paul says, the, the, the voices in the world, that there's some who know different languages. Paul had that. Paul knew Greek, Hebrew, and Latin, at least. And he had the gift of tongues. So he could, he could, he could speak in tongues. And not only by spiritual giftedness, but also by his upbringing. <clears throat> and so you could have someone like that who comes along and knows a second language or a third language. <clears throat> and you come along and they want to, they want to show something. And, um, and they're, they're, they're speaking another language. And Paul's going to address it all. Is that it's, There's no edifying taking place. And that's the most important thing. That's the most charitable thing. Now, the proper use of, spiritual, uh, of uh, the spiritual gift of tongues, the most charitable thing is to use it where it's supposed to be used so someone that you don't know their language and you speak in their tongue and you share the, with them the gospel or you share with them uh, uh, the knowledge of the truth. But when it comes to when you're in the local assembly and you have believers there already and you just begin doing the counterfeit, or you begin speaking in another language, that's not charitable. Because no one else is being edified. In fact, you're not even being edified. In the sense of edification in regards to teaching and being educated. He says in verse 1, follow after charity. He just comes out of chapter 13, he says, follow after charity. And desire spiritual gifts. That's what they're supposed to desire. We saw, we saw last week in Ephesians chapter 4 that, that they were given for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of, of, uh, the body of Christ. So desiring spiritual gifts, that's what they're, they're supposed to do, especially the ones that they have as they've been distributed uh, their spiritual gifts. But look, look what he says. He says, but rather. So there's something else that they're supposed to rather desire greater and more than spiritual gifts. He says, but rather that ye may prophesy. Now the interesting thing is, is before he came along in chapter 12 and he says, are all apostles? And the answer to that is no. 
In verse 29, are all, prof are all prophets? The answer to that is no. Are all teachers? The answer to that is no. Are all workers of miracles? Is the answer no. Have all the gifts of healing? No. Do all speak with tongues? No. Do all interpret? No. So there's different spiritual gifts, and they're supposed to desire spiritual gifts. But he says, but rather that ye may prophesy. What he's saying is that, you know what? All of you can prophesy. Now, prophesy is not how we think about your connection with prophecy. Um, I want to do a study, one, to, to get my own understanding uh, uh, better on this issue. But, but for, for just to get the point across, prophesying is to be able to, to, to share God's word. Not necessarily as a, as a teacher, but the ability to share God's word. And again, the issue of there when he says in, back in chapter 12, are all teachers, he talks about the, the spiritual gift of being a teacher. But what eventually God wants to get accomplished in the local assembly is that people come to the knowledge of the truth and are able to share the word of God. And that's what the word of God, the unity of the faith is going to provide, is that I don't need a, a spiritual gifted teacher or a spiritual gifted apostle or prophet to come along and, and, and teach me. I now have the word of God that I can learn from and be able to share it with others. And all of them can prophesy. All of them are supposed to desire more than their spiritual gift to prophesy. And that's what Paul says over there in Ephesians chapter 4. He says, um, uh, you don't have to turn there. Uh, I'll just read you the verse. He says, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working and the measure of every part maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. That's not just spiritual gifted people edifying the body, as he says earlier on in Ephesians 4, but that the whole body would be able to edify itself. Every member, every part, and every, the effectual working of, of that measure of, of God's word of the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ in every part, sharing with another member and sharing with another member so that the edifying of the body of Christ could, be, could edify itself in love, in that charity. And the issue in spiritual gifts is that that's not necessarily the way it takes place. You're more dependent upon those three top ones, the apostles, prophets, and the teachers. But eventually the time's going to come when the knowledge is going to be given to where they can... They can all go into it. Look at verse 2 of chapter 14. It says, For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him. That's what he means by unknown. It's not that this is a heavenly language. That's what a lot of those people teach. Um, he, said, he says, For no man understandeth him. No man understandeth him. How be it? In the, how be it? Because no man understandeth him, in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. Now, if you knew the language, it wouldn't be a mystery to you. But, it's an unknown tongue. The people in the church don't know the tongue. And so, it's not understood by them, and it's just a mystery to them. He goes on verse 3, But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to what? And he's going to drive this point home over and over again. An exhortation and comfort. Verse 4, he that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth what? Himself. But he that prophesieth edifieth the church. Which one's greater? To edify yourself or to edify more than yourself? The church. It's clearly what he's saying. Follow after charity. If you're going to follow after charity with your spiritual gifts, you're going to edify the church. Because you don't just have yourself in view. You have the church in view. You have others in view. And you know what? That i got to make sure I don't get my blood boiling here. Do you know that's exactly what, does, that's what, exactly what goes on in, 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 the, in that movement? It's, it's, you, you, I'm not saying there isn't some, uh, someone there in sincerity and, and, and honesty and those kind of things. But you're in that stuff for a long time. You're in it for yourself. That's what Paul teaches. You're not concerned 
about the person next to you. In fact, you'll roll over them on the ground. You'll push them. You'll bark at them. Or someone will hit you. You're, con you're concerned about yourself, not the church. And you're definitely not concerned about their edification because edification can't take place unless there's understanding. It goes on, verse 5. Traction in verse 4 there, so it says, He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. How is he edifying himself? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, I think what, he, what, he's, what he's saying there is in connection with his gift towards God. Uh, is that there's a... I don't think he's using it in the same way in regards to the, the edification of the church. But rather that, that he has this and he's speaking this to, this to God. He's, um, that he's got this, this gift towards God. Um, That'd probably be the best way to describe it. He's going he's gonna to talk about this a little bit more um, as he goes on. And so we'll pick it up as we get a little bit further on in the verses. But that's a great question. Um, he goes on verse 5. He says, I would that you all spake with tongues, but rather that you prophesied. For greater is he. And we already know that because of the ranking that we got in chapter 12. For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues. Except, and here there's the exception. Except he interpret, because if he can interpret and get, share the, share the, uh, uh, what he's saying in the tongue, it says that the church may receive edifying, because then you're speaking in the tongue of what's being said, and the church receives edifying. Um, again, as you go through this, just to get back to, to John's question in, re, in relationship to, to verse 4 there, you see that in connection with the edification, he's, he's talking about understanding in the church. And if he's talking about understanding in the church, when he says, uh, he that edifieth himself, he's, 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 he's talking about it in a, in a negative sense. He's not talking about it in the same light as he is over there. Um, and I think if, if one other thing that would, would be there is that in connection with him using the same term, is again, he wants them to understand of what, what is true edification. Uh, look at verse 6. He says, Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you? Except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine. Those are all the ways in which he comes speaking to them. He says, but if I come, speaking, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, he's not going to profit them. He's not going to profit them. Verse 7, again, I... I Eventually, when we get here in 1 Corinthians 14, we'll talk about the revelation, the knowledge, the prophesying, and, and the doctrine, and the differences of those and those kind of things and the similarities, but I just don't have time to do it in this study. Verse 7, and even things without life-giving sound. So now he's going to bring up an illustration. Whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harp? And he gives an example. For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? So a trumpet go out there and, and it'll have a, a certain sound that comes along and says, okay, it's time for battle. Well, you mess around with that trumpeteer and he gives an uncertain sound. That could be big trouble for your, your army, for your soldiers. Because they might not know that the bat the, the, we're in the battle. The battle started, or we're starting the battle. He says, so likewise ye. So now he's, he uses that analogy, and now he's bringing it to them, that illustration. He says, so likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. With all these things, again, I, just going back to, because I, I had that same question that John has in verse 4. If he speaks in an unknown tongue, and he doesn't even understand what himself is speaking, how can he edify himself? And again, I, I mentioned some of the things before. But I, one of the things is that it, it, it's, it's basically that God knows what I'm saying, and there's some kind of, there's some kind of sense of uh, uh, 
the sense of, well, God knows what I'm saying and I can appreciate that. That's the kind of sense in which he's talking about uh, edifying himself there. Um, so again, uh, back to uh, verse 9, he says, So likewise ye accept ye utter by tongue words easy to be understood. How shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. And I think that's interesting, because it's important, obviously, in the context of the spiritual gift of tongues, but it's also, again, in connection with, there can be legitimate people who speak more than one language. As I mentioned before, Paul, uh, Paul knew, again, Greek and, and Hebrew. Um, you, you go through the Acts account, and, and he's, he's speaking in Greek, and then in the Hebrew tongue, he, he speaks. And so he's, he knows more than one language by his upbringing, by his education. And there's no doubt that, um, that there are some also in Corinth. By the way, I, I just got to slide this in there. Um, Corinth is most likely the second most populated place of Jewish people. Which, remember, tongues is a believing to uh, a sign of the unbelieving Jews. But not only that, but it's a, it's a city of, of commerce. There's a lot of different nations and different people groups colliding there at Corinth. And which is one of the reasons why it's dealt with in Corinth. And so... The church was brought up against the synagogue too. I mean, share a wall. Right, right. Yeah, one of the churches was, was uh, as a recorder in Acts right against the synagogue there. So, again, this has a lot more depth to it than what we're looking at in regards to history, in regards to the locale in which it's at and why it'd be such a prevalent thing there in Corinth. Um, so, again, verse uh, 10, there are and may be so many kinds of voices in the world and none of them is without signification. They're, they're all significant. They're all significant. And he says, verse 11, Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. And that's what happens naturally. You go to a different country, you go to a different, uh, that use a different part of the world, and they have a different kind of voice, and a different kind of language, and those kind of things, and you're like a barbarian unto them. They, we, you know, they have great technology advances now where you can come along and speak what you want. You just select the, the criteria and, um, and, and it's that language, you know, Chinese, and you speak um, hello. And it records you saying hello and it comes out the other end in Chinese, hello. And everyone's amazed and so they speak something in Chinese and it records it back to you in English. And, but without those kind of things, you're, you're a barbarian, unless you know the language or unless you learn the language. And that's the spiritual gift. That's what, that was the gap that the spiritual gift bridged. And that's, the, therefore, the situation, circumstance it would be. But if you're taking that out of the, that, that specific situation and circumstance, and you're doing that in a setting where you're all speaking the same language, and yet you, or you, can all, you all speak the same language, but yet you're not, then you're doing something that takes place uh, in a different, different uh, part of the world and those kind of things. Uh, verse 12. Even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. He says, verse 13. Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit and I will sing with the understanding also. That's supposed to take place in your spirit. And that's kind of in the sense of what he's, uh, I feel like, uh, not feel like, that what he's, what he's expounding upon in connection with verse 4 is that he's, he speaks in an unknown tongue. He's speaking in his spirit, if he's got the legitimate gift of tongues. Um, and in that sense, there's, he's using that sense of edifying. Um, but yet, he doesn't have the understanding. You've got you to pray for understanding. You gotta, he says he's going to come along and say, pray that you also, or he said that before, pray that you also would interpret so that the church might receive edifying. 
Verse 14, for if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is what? Unfruitful. Unfruitful. Verse 15, what is it then? I will pray with the spirit, and I will pray with the understanding. Also, I will sing with the spirit, and I will sing with the understanding. Also, verse 16, else when thou, thou shalt bless with the spirit, the unknown tongue, how shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned? So now he's bringing up those who are unlearned. How, how, uh, how shall they that occupy the room and learn say amen? How can they be in agreement when they don't understand what you're saying? Say amen at thy giving of thanks, seeing he understandeth not what thou sayest. For thou verily givest thanks well, but the other is not edified. I thank my God I speak tongues more than ye all. Again, not only by his upbringing, but also a spiritual gift. Any nation he would go into and he needed that tongue, he was able to speak in that tongue, especially as the apostle of the Gentiles. So he, he thanks God. I thank my guy. I speak tongues more than y'all. But look what he says, verse 19. Yet in the church. He's not using tongues in the church. He's using tongues outside the church. He says, yet in the church I had rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. In an unknown tongue. <clears throat> Brethren, be not children in understanding. Remember back there in, in, in chapter uh, 13 at the end he says in verse 11, when I was a child I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man I put away childish things. Well, they had in the in the, the knowledge that they had in part. So they're in that sense, in regards to the measure of the knowledge that they have at that time, they're children, but they can, they can take that measure of the knowledge that they have and they can treat it as an adult. That they would take that knowledge and be able to communicate and share it with one another with understanding instead of without understanding. It says, how be in malice be ye children, but in understanding, be men. Be men. Grow up in this. And then he brings up the law, verse 21. In the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people, and yet for all that will they hear me, saith the Lord. They will not hear me. Wherefore, here's the mini conclusion. By the way, that, co that comes from Isaiah 28, in, in chapters 28 and 29. He talked about that. And we talked about tongues before. It was a final sign to Israel. If my understanding is correct, when he says, when he says what he says there in connection with that, and you have the third declaration of what, uh, in Acts 28 there, when he says, I'm, I'm no longer uh, speaking to the, to, to the Jews, but I'm, I'm going to the Gentiles there, that, that gift of tongues was done. That gift of tongues was done. And that's why in Ephesians, he can say, I gave them. We don't have time to develop that too much, but that's, that's a, something you could study out. Verse 22, wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe. And you're speaking them, you're using it in the church. You all want the same one, tongues. You're using it where it's not supposed to be used. And amongst people whom you're not supposed to be using it against. Using it towards. But to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not. But for them which believe. That's why he would have them rather prophesy. And seek to prophesy. Verse 23, if therefore the whole church be come together into one place and all speak with tongues and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, what's interesting here is he said before that he just got done saying it, you speak it to unbelievers. But unbelievers who don't speak your tongue. If an unbeliever comes in, you don't speak to them in a tongue. If they have the same language as you do, you don't speak in the tongue, that tongue to them. Well, see, God's with us. I can do this. No, if one comes in who is an unbeliever, is unlearned, and he comes into one, and you're gathered in one place, and there come in those that are unlearned, and unbelieving, will they not say that ye are what? Man. You're mad. Madness. Madness is going on in this place. 
Verse 24, but if all prophesy, and all can, and there come in one that believeth not, or one unlearned, he is convinced of all. He is judged of all, and thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. Like-mindedness and having a same mind, those are things that are able to take place and should be taking place in the local assembly. Not only because it can, and that's God's intent, but it also can fulfill other things. Is that someone who doesn't know what we teach here, or an unbeliever comes in, and they talk to a, a, a few of us here, and we all share the same gospel with them. That's a, a witness upon a witness upon a witness, a testimony upon a testimony upon a testimony. They, they, they may never get that type of experience ever again outside these walls. Think about that. To be able to encounter one person, okay, I'm done dealing with them, now I go down to this other store and I have another conversation and I hear the same thing. No, but when they come in these walls, that's what's supposed to happen. That's why unity is, supposed to, is so important. And, and, and the faith in having the, the, com, the complete knowledge of, of readily available to us is so that we can study it, we can learn it, and be, have like-mindedness in connection with it. That's what's supposed to be taking place. I've had some conversations with people is that they say, that's too boring. They, they've come here before, and they said, well, everyone, everyone has kind of been in this for years, and we want to go to a, a church where people don't know this. I think, what? I get your heart, and that's not bad. But to come along and forsake the assembling of like-minded believers, you don't understand the purpose of the local assembly. And you're supposed to have this to be able to bring people into so that they can come along and they can hear, okay, Jimmy was teaching this to me. I've come to the church and now I've had five conversations. He's not the only one. He's not as crazy as I thought because there's more than one. Well, that's what he's dealing with here. And yet, here they are in Corinth. They have wonderful opportunities and they're just wasting the opportunities. We can learn this now, even if, without the gift of tongues. Is that what, what are we speaking with those who are coming in? And are we trying to evaluate whether they've believed the true gospel? And if they haven't, then share the gospel with them. And if they do believe the gospel, share with them the truth. Come to knowledge of truth, share with them right to vision, share with them about uh, godly edification and Paul's epistles and those kind of things. But here they're wasting opportunities because they're, they're just focused on themselves. They want to they they edify themselves in the sense of neglecting the edification of all others. That's what he's talking about there in verse 3. Or verse 4 there. Verse 26. How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. Let all things be done Unto what? Why when I, when I took over for Ron, it's not that he's never taught, he never taught on it, because he did. But when I wanted to get started, we talked about the purpose of the local assembly. It's a classroom for the teaching of sound doctrine so that godly edification takes place. Because Paul, not only does he talk about that elsewhere, but when he's in the context of spiritual gifts, he says you can use these things that are, is not under edification. And the whole local assembly, the function of it is for that you'd be edified. Verse 27, if any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most by three, and that by course. Guess what they were doing? Just going off, rattling off, this person here, that person there, that person there. Okay, if you're going to do this, you've got the legitimate gift of tongues. You hold your peace. You go course by course. And he says, and let one interpret. If you don't got an interpret it, interpreter, close your mouth. And he's going to say that the spirit of, uh, uh, I'll go, let's go on here a little bit. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most by three. That's as many as that was supposed to take place when they gathered together. At the most three. <laughs> Think about this stuff in contrast to what's going on today. 
They don't just got two or three. The whole church. Maybe they got two or three thousand. How would, if you didn't know what tongue you were going to speak, how would, how would you be able to line, even line up the interpreter? That, well, that, that was the spiritual gift. It was a spiritual gift. Spiritual gift could come along as you, you don't know what language um, in, which, in which you were speaking. Because if you did know the language, then you could come along and share it in your own language, right? If, if you didn't even know the language that you were speaking, the other spiritual gift, the interpreter, would have the spiritual gift come along and say, he's speaking in this, and I can translate it into this. And I can, I can share that. I can interpret it to what it is. The interpretation isn't necessarily a gift. It could be just somebody who understands and yeah I mean I mean if you've got someone there who you know Paul there's you know they didn't know the Hebrew language and someone speaking in Hebrew or you know and and they don't know it and and Paul I know this is a weird scenario but and Paul knows Hebrew from up yeah, yeah sure I mean the issue is the edification so it doesn't necessarily matter how it comes, but but the, the you have the issue of do all interpret that's a that's a that was a gift that was a gift to come along and say Oh, they're speaking in this language, but I also have the ability now to, in that moment, I, I get that language and I can bring it in my own language. The, the, the one who had the tongues didn't have that necessarily that capacity. They just, they just spoke it and it was for the benefit of the one hearing it in that language. <coughs> the interpreter would come along and, um, and, and, and share that if, if there was one. If there wasn't one, they weren't supposed to, have, they weren't supposed to speak. Um, verse 28, but if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. Let the prophets speak two or three and let the other judge. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. See, everything is supposed to be done decently and in order. He says, for ye may all prophesy one by one. See, there's the difference. Tongues two, at the most by three, that by course. And when, if you got a prophesy, if you got a, uh, if something was revealed to you, and you want to prophesy, you can prophesy. But even with prophesy, prophesying, which all can do, and, and, and excels to edify the church, now you don't just get to do this randomly, because that's going to be the same kind of thing. That is one by one. One by one. That all may learn and all may be comforted. Verse 32, and the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion. These, these, a lot of these guys in there, you're, you're, you're a true prophet and you're doing things inconsistent. They have the, they have the control over um, what, what's going on inside them. It says, verse 33, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. The argument against that is, well, we have to let go of control, and the Spirit takes over, and the Spirit's in control. And, and, and then the fruit of that is confusion. But, but the Spirit is in control. That's what, that, that's what, they, that's what they say. Which spirit? Well, that's, that's what we'll talk about in a little bit. Verse 33 again. For God's not thought of confusion, but of peace, as, it, as in all the churches of the saints. Let your women keep silence in the churches. One of the biggest big things that was going on in Corinth, the women were doing it. And they were to keep silence in the churches. For it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. For it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Now again, he's not talking like a, a, a woman can't talk at all in the church. He's talking about in the teaching capacity. He's talking about the communication of, uh, of, of the word and the doctrine in that, that leadership role. He's, he's not even necessarily saying it in connection with, because he says that all the way prophesy. He's not even saying it on, a, on a, 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 another scenario, having a conversation with someone that you can't share what you've learned. You can't share the word of God. 
But from that leadership role, that one by one role and those kind of things, um, that's not what's supposed to take place, but that was what was taking place. He says, what? Came the word of God out from you? Or came it unto you only? If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you, the very things that I'm writing unto you, are the commandments of the who. You don't do this. Even if they were in operation today, if you're not doing them the way in which it's stipulated here, you're going against the commandments of the Lord. In verse 38, but if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. A lot of ignorance out there. A lot. And a lot of, a lot of times you can't, you try to reason, reason's thrown out the window. Order, structure, thrown out the window. Confusion, the experience that they had is what they rely upon and what they always bank upon instead of the word of God. And he comes along and says, if they want to be ignorant, let them be ignorant. Verse 39, wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy and forbid not to speak with tongues. Okay, he's not saying don't, you never speak with tongues. He's, this is how you're supposed to use them. This is where you're supposed to use them. If you use them in the church, you got to interpret one or two or, or two or three at the most and let there be interpret, no interpreter, keep silence. You got the gift of interpretation? Okay, I'll go. Interpreter, come up, interpret that. All right, I'm ready. I'm going to speak in tongues. Okay, you got to interpret? Okay. Because what's, what, what's important is the edifying of the whole body. There might be two people who can't speak the same language and they're in the church and so you, they speak in their tongue and it benefits them but you also got a whole bunch of other people who don't speak that tongue that the interpreter will come and speak it off. Now all are edified. That's the most important thing. Verse 40, let all things be done, what? Decently and in order. Now, the time we have remaining, I, I, trust me, I know I, I went, I breezed right through that. Um, and so if you have any other questions, uh, we can talk about it afterwards. But I want to take the 15 minute ish minutes that we have and talk about some of the background. Uh, this is going to be more or less us not necessarily going through God's word. Um, I wanted to go through some other things as well over there in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. In chapter 11, uh, as, as the spiritual gifts started w waxing and waning, um, Paul got criticized for it. You had guys who were still there in Corinth who were operating upon the, these, these counterfeits. They had, he, he says they glory in their outward appearance, but they don't glory in heart. And Paul's getting to that point where he, he's just glorying in heart. And they're in their outward appearance. And he comes along and he says, they're, they're ministers of unrighteousness. They're, they're, they're ministers of darkness, but, and, but dressed up in light. And, and, and we shouldn't be fooled of that because Satan was an angel of light. And he can transform himself into that light, counterfeit light. And um, he says to watch out. And he says, they take, they take of you, and they, they, they even lay their hands on them. And he's not talking about the, he's talking about they, they get rough with them. And the same kind of things, and, and, and Paul gets into, and what he says, he says, you know what, I'd rather boast in my infirmities. If I'm going to glory, I'm going to glory in my infirmities. That's the next essential doctrine, suffering. And he glories in that. He could, have, he, he could have done what he did there in, in, in chapter 14. He says, I speak more in tongues. And he could along, went along and listed experience after experience after experience. And when he spoke this un, unknown tongue, uh, and, and, it, and it profited the one who he, was, who he was speaking to and those kind of things, and magnified. But he understood the gifts. He understood what was coming. He understood what was more uh, uh, profitable and those kind of things. And instead of doing that, he started talking about his sufferings. So there's some good material, good content to deal with over there in chapter 10 and chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians as the, 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 the fading starts coming out and the, 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 the more perfect, the more excellent way it comes and eventually it's going to be done away and you're going to have on the pedestal is the word of God and that working godly love and charity. Um, so I encourage you to go look at that. Now, I'm gonna, we're going to...
talk about kind of the modern history of these things. Again, I'm, I'm sure that before 1901, a lot of these things existed in one sense or one form, but they really came, uh, really became a big issue uh, in, in 1901. I got two resources, out, resources I want to make mention of again. Again, I don't endorse everything uh, that these people believe, but their resources, in fact, I didn't even know I had this one. Um, but this one is called Strange Fire. It's by, again, John MacArthur. And um, um, I, essentially, the understanding that I have about spiritual gifts is I, ha I had, even before I learned right division. <clears throat> um, and I learned a lot from John MacArthur on the topic, on the issue. Um, there's a, there are a few points that, again, I disagree with, but a lot of it I, I do. And he, he had this new book they came out with. His first one was called Charismatic Chaos. This one's called Strange Fire. And what he does in Strange Fire is um, he talks about um, kind of, again, the history of these things. So there's a lot of resources. He's got a lot of uh, resources he looks into and he, uh, he indexes and all those kind of things. And uh, one of them I realized I had in my library. I got it uh, as a gift. Um, and uh, it's by Robert Lyardin called God's Generals. And in here, he extols the very ones that we're going to be talking about that kind of got this movement going. And, um, and so there's these, uh, you can, there's more information regards to those things if you want to get those books or if you ever want to borrow them or something like that. So we're going to, I'm just going to be sharing information and tidbits that I've learned from those, uh, these books and, and some of my own uh, research on the subject as well. Um, it was 1901, it was New Year's Day, nonetheless, and uh, Charles Par Parham, Parham, Charles Fox Parham had a college, uh, a Bible college as it were. He had students that basically had to give up everything that they had and come and partic to participate in this college and God will provide for them and all these kind of things. And um, he... They were going through the book of Acts, and um, he went away on a trip, and he came back, and um, everyone studied, they said, everyone looked at the book, uh, things of Acts, and he says, tongues all, always follow those who were baptized by the Spirit. And so they said, we should be speaking in tongues then, or we should be getting this baptism of the Spirit. Again, there's this th theology was before this. Parham uh, um, taught it and those kind of things, the second blessing, second baptism, um, those kind of things. And um, they ended up having a prayer service, an all-night prayer service. Go figure. Um, the reason why I say that is because when you look at a lot of these kind of things, a lot of it is emotionally charged. So you got to get the music you, got to, you have these, you know, IHOP, Inter International House of Prayer, that's open 24-7, and they're just there praying, and they have all this, these, you know, the people speak in tongues, and this, that, and the other, and the music's playing, and they're praying, and they're praying, and they're praying, and it's, it's a perfect environment for the emotions. I don't know about you, but I get, um, when I get tired, I get, I get kind of crabby, and, um, I can kind of get emotional. Take something that's very small and it just becomes a big deal to me. And, um, and you think, well, why would you bring that into this? That has nothing to do. That has a lot to do, the factor into this stuff. Uh, and music and those kind of things. They were there long past 12 a.m. And um, again, in weeks prior, were, the students were intently studying Acts. And that baptism of the Holy Spirit is a subsequent to salvation. Tongues was a true sign of the Spirit baptism. And they were thinking maybe it's still true now. So they pleaded with God to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So that's where their mind is at already. Now, that completely neglects, obviously, right division, but it also completely neglects what was going on in Israel's program in regards to the, the Holy Spirit and that baptism and all those kind of things. And uh, Charles Parr, a, a Methodist minister, encouraged them. It was the early morning hours, and this gal, a woman, again, we just saw that, this woman asked Charles Parham to lay hands on her. 
And Charles Parham recounted that I laid my hands upon her and prayed. I had scarcely completed three dozen sentences when a glory fell upon her. A halo seemed to surround her head and face, and she began speaking the Chinese language and was unable to speak English for three days. When she tried to write in English to tell us of her experience, she wrote the Chinese. Now, you later find out almost all of that is not true. The student, a lot of the other students there completely disregarded that. They completely said that was false. She testified that she spoke this tongue, which you find out was not even Chinese. A couple of weeks prior, when he was gone, she had spoken. It wasn't the first time. And here they're saying that it was the first time. Uh, again, this account was again shared by fellow students and the teachers. Um, after that, they had a series of revival meetings. And uh, supposedly what followed and what was reported was 20 different languages spoken. Russian, Japanese, Bulgarian, French, Bohemian, Norwegian, Hungarian, Italian, and Spanish. Parham claimed to speak himself in Swedish and other languages. And this is what began the modern Pentecostal movement. This one night, 1901, New Year's Eve and the New Year's Day, this experience that took place into the wee hours of the morning. Pentecostal historian Vincent Sinan explains Osman's experience thus became the prototype experience for all the millions of Pentecostals who were to follow. Lay hands, get the emotional charge, and let's get the experience. Within 10 years, <clears throat> 50,000 50, would have the same phenomenon. So eventually, this took, by the way, this took place in Topeka, Kansas. <clears throat> But it traveled to the West Coast. One of uh, Parham's followers and students, William J. Seymour, <clears throat> believed the same kind of doctrine. And again, um, now, about you know, 100, pl 100 plus years later, half a billion adhere to, to this, this as the new Pentecost. Parham named it the Apostolic Faith Movement. It was the new Pentecost. However, investigation calls all this into question. There's conflicting versions of the story, the main players. Parham uh, said that uh, <clears throat> Osman, Agnes, went three days and didn't speak English when it was reported she did just one day later. There was questions, which to me is kind of insignificant, but questions whether it was really New Year's Eve or New Year's Day. And... Um, that they didn't participate in a tongue study assignment prior as claimed. She claimed to speak in tongues three weeks prior to New Year's Eve, as, as others said as well. She claimed she only knew of the significance of the language later, not as Parham claimed right away, which you find out this, there is no, there's no significance. You, you, let me, I'll just keep reading. Not all involved believed it. <clears throat> Uh, in fact, one of the students said, I believe the whole of them are crazy. They're mad, right? <clears throat> Never actually experienced miraculous ability to speak uh, in authentic foreign languages. What they desperately desired <clears throat> ends, ends up being nonsensical gibberish. The reality became painfully obvious when Parham, over the next course of a few years, <clears throat> insisted that they have... <clears throat> I got something lodged in my throat. That they get missionaries to go to foreign lands without first going to language school. His guarantees backfired. The missionaries went out and he went to different languages, different nations, and different tongues, and they didn't understand them. It, it's funny, but it's. It's sad. If you remember the writings that she supposedly wrote in Chinese, well, they ended up being chicken scratch and resemble no known language. This was done by those that were investigating in the, in the matter. 
The personal character of Parham also comes into question. Shortly after this, he was forced to close the Bible school in Topeka. He traveled and held revival meetings, claimed 5,000 5, devotees. The fall of 1906, so uh, five, um, six years later, held a series of meetings in Zion, Illinois. Five of the followers beat a disabled woman to death in an attempt to drive the demon of her arthritis from her. A young girl in Kansas died because her parents refused medical treatment, which is, again, also one of the things that came out of this was Christian, if you ever heard of Christian science? When we played at Northwestern, we played Principia College. Principia College, they would get a football player would get hurt on the football field. They were not allowed to, ha we were not allowed to bring medical attention to them. Everyone sat around him and prayed while he's going, ow, ow, oh. Very, very serious stuff. They didn't seek medical treatment, insisted, uh, instead sought healing through Parham's ministry. And he was, again, uh, he was, again, that was part of him forcing to leave Kansas. And he went to Texas. Here he met that William Seymour. William Seymour was a 35-year-old African-American, embraced Parham's teachings. And he sparked the Azusa Street Revival in L.A. in 1906. The relationship soon soured when Parham, because he Parham it was, you find out, and even more, became a racist. He endorsed the Ku Klux Klan. His relationship soon soured, and Parham insisted he didn't approve of the wild behavior of the meetings. When he went to Azusa Street, and he went to L.A., and he saw his own student, and he came along and says what they were doing was so wild, he didn't agree with it. There was traditional African-American worship styles, shouting, trances, and the holy dance. No order of service because the Holy Ghost, again, is in control. Parham's story worsens, however. 1907, arrested at a hotel in San Antonio, Texas, on charges of sodomy. Claimed it was false, but wrote a full confession for his release. Tactic, tactics changed. He eventually raised money for expedition to the Holy Land, to find Noah's Ark and the Ark of the Covenant, he raised funds, went back to Kansas, and told his followers that he was mugged after arriving in New York. He was also attracted to erroneous doctrines, conditional immorality, or that the wicked would eventually be annihilated. Um, at times he sounded like a universalist, that everyone's going to be saved. He had an unorthodox view of human depravity, total depravity, human fallenness. Sinners could redeem themselves with a combination of their own effort and God's help. It sounds it's Catholicism. Sanctification guarantees physical healings and medical treatment for ailment was an act of unbelief. Parham was also into Anglo-Israelism. There's a lot of different Israelisms out there. Well, he was an Ang Anglo-Israelist. Again, which Paul says not to be given to endless genealogies but that the, in Western Europe is where the true Israelites were. They descended from the 10 tribes of Israel after dispersing the Assyrian captivity. White European, white Europeans, European, thank you, are the true chosen people, sure enough, became outspoken as an advocate of racial segregation. It's also why he was a part of that argument with William Seymour. Supposedly from testimonies, that argument included racial slurs, and again, eventually in 1927, he openly endorsed the Ku Klux Klan. Um, That's where they get but, the page, the caucus, and the ten lost tribes. Right. Um, and you go 90 years later, and you have the big thing where a lot, a lot of this is still around, and those kind of things, and then you have the, I don't know if you know much about the Toronto Blessing in the mid-1990s, um, where, again, this took took another shape and form who you find out a lot of those leaders again are involved in such horrible things uh, that you can't even fathom uh, there's one guy I forget the guy's name uh, he's one of the main leaders now in this movement and uh, he talks about uh, um, holy marijuana and um, token the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's, it's, bl it's blasphemous. It's absolutely blasphemous. And they, they follow him. They follow him all across the country. He's got, he's got classes now. 
New, new Mystics, that's what his website's called. And that's exactly where this stuff comes from. You look at the body language, you look at the barking, you look at all the, the, the wailing and flailing, and it's the same thing as, as the, the Eastern cultures over there. And the, uh, I forget what they call it, but the, 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 Kindle, the Kindle, Kindle spirit that the uh, India and all those in, in Indians get involved in. And they're hooping and hollering and flailing their, flailing their arms and those kind of things and the twitching. And, the, and, and one, um, one of the gals involved in the Toronto Blessing, she gets up and she quotes 1 first, first Corinthians chapter 13. And she, she comes along and instead of teaching the passage, she says that the Holy Spirit taught her what the passage actually means as she's up there flailing back and forth. And you think, what in the world is going on? You, you see some of the videos that, that take place, what's going on, and how people are, and got the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel involved in it. Um, you know, you obviously got the big namers, Benny Hinn and Kenneth Copeland. Kenneth Copeland was questioned on the carpet. You know, he's open. He's open to talking and all those kind of things, and he was, he was questioned on his five jets that he had, one that the church bought for over $20 million. And he said, that's none of your business. And it, it just it gets, it gets worse and worse and worse. There's only a few, I know of just a few churches that are still Pentecostal in their beliefs and actually follow the prescribed order in which things are supposed to take place. They get it, they get it you know, a little bit right, which is really all wrong because the things are not in operation at all anymore. And Paul warns Timothy, this stuff is just going to get worse and worse and worse. And he calls it over there, he calls it what it is. It's vain babblings. It's acting like a child. It's, 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 not, even, it's not even child. It's, just, it's worse than that. Um, but again, that was just a brief history into, uh, into where, where it began. There's a whole lot more that you can look at it. Uh, we don't necessarily have the time for, but um, be aware. Be aware of those kind of things. John? Uh, a comment. Last week, after I left here, there was somebody on TV that spoke the complete opposite of that word. And listening to him and listening to you, then I put the two together. And it came down to that uh, chapter 13, verse 10, where it says, when the perfect one, but that which is perfect is come. They look at that perfect one. Jesus Christ. Yep. They're looking for Jesus Christ to come, so until that happens, all these gifts are still in manifestation. Yep. But you're teaching it that it's the inspired word of God that comes, which is already here now, and that's what I believe in, that it is the word of God, and that you don't need the gifts of prophecy, interpretation, and tongues because you already have it in the word. Yep. And like I asked you on... Uh, 14.4, what that meant. Yeah. Well, you kind of interpreted what that verse meant, but you read the verse and you helped interpret it. Right. You didn't need tongues to interpret to it. it. Yeah. I can see where they get into that because yep. they take that one line and say, well, until Jesus comes, yep. these are all still manifest. Yep. I remember being at uh, Northwestern College and being in a class. And uh, we were talking about the authority of God's word. <clears throat> and uh, a friend of mine, I was playing on the basketball team with him, and I stood for the authority of God's word. And I said, well, it's, it's complete. And everything that the Spirit wants to educate us and teach us in is right here. And he, he in the class, this is before I knew right division, in the class, openly laughed at me. And he says, no, the Spirit will reveal a lot more to you. You just got to open yourself up. In front, of the, in front of the whole class. And um, I said, show me that in scripture and I'll believe you. And, um, uh, you know, the, there's, a lot of that, there's a lot of that stuff going on. And that's usually what they diminish is, is the word of God. And um, you're exactly right. They make that the, the perfect one. They make that Christ when the context doesn't allow for that. And again, if you get into Greek, which I'm not... There's no way that Greek word can be a person. 
There's, there's words in the Greek that are used for an actual person, individual, even if they were identified as the Messiah, the perfect one. It would be a word that, rep- that identifies an actual individual. That Greek word is not, uh, has nothing to do with, it's in the neuter. It's, it's not in connection with the individual, it's in connection with something, a thing. And that thing is right in the context is knowledge. I know in part, I prophesy in part, but that, but, which is connecting it to that verse, but that when that which is perfect comes, well, two and two, you know, is four, you know. Knowledge in part, prophesy in part, perfect. Well, perfect in part, well, that's the same realm of thinking. Instead of jumping to a knowledge in part, <clears throat> and that's also what they'll believe as well, is that they can only have the partial, they only have the partial knowledge now, <clears throat> and completely neglect. And that's and, and 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 anything more than that partial knowledge has to come from the Spirit revealing it to them, instead of what you have in the Scriptures. And again, all of it is exactly against what the spiritual gifts were designed to complete. Is the Word of God? These spiritual gifts are against what those spiritual gifts were actually working toward. And by that, it's, it's, you, you begin to see these things and it's, it becomes clear and clear and clear who's behind all that and the ignorance. Uh, and it, I mean, it's Satan. There's, there's it's one of the many distractions. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's, out of the yep, absolutely. Yep, yep. Or, and we or could. Give in the word if they don't really buy it, they're, they're spiritualists or all, they're going to take your. We're in the latter rain. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Well, anyways, if you've got more questions to talk after, I'll, I'll, I'll close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time to look into these things and to know what is going around, uh, going on in, in the world today, going on in, uh, with those that identify themselves as uh, members of the body of Christ. And Father, we pray that they are, that they have believed that Christ died for their sins, was buried, and rose again. But we also pray, Father, that through understanding these things now, that uh, when we come in contact with those, we know uh, them, we know exactly what's going on, and that we can uh, influence them and, and bring them to the knowledge of the truth and, and share these truths with them in love, in meekness, and, and gently, and um, in hopes that they would change their mind, give them the proper information in which they can change their mind with. If they don't, that's, that's, that's fine. That's their their decision, their choice, but may we share this truth with them, and I pray, Father, as we went through these seven lessons, we got a little bit better understanding of these things, to be able to be more equipped uh, to share what is right, what is true. Um, Father, we thank you that you're not the author of confusion. We thank you that you're, you want all things to be done decently and in order. And, um, Father, may that not only be true of what we do here at Twin Cities Grace Fellowship, but also in our lives. And that's what godly edification through the effectual working of your word does in our uh, inner man. It builds us up properly, uh, how we need to be built up to be able to live our lives properly and uh, decently and in order that you might be glorified. Father, we pray if someone's here listening, if they not trusted Christ, how they died for their sins, was buried and rose again, that they would believe that wonderful gospel this very moment. The moment they do, be justified unto eternal life, have in their possession, the forgiveness of all their sins, past, present, and future, your righteousness imputed unto them, and they'll possess the gift of eternal life as well. We pray that they believe this very moment. And lastly, we thank you for this time of grace giving. We do it uh, in a connection with your word, in response to your word, and, and learning it, how you teach it. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.